finger guns means uh, we're online. So once you can hear me, uh, please confirm and we will get our lovely show started. Hello, Twitch world. I see a hey from Johnson BSG of Yavor. Welcome, Yavor. It's always great to see you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, welcome to 2022, everybody. This is dev stream number 24, the first in the new year. It is great to see you guys. Um, I think we're going to have a fun show today. I have uh, my my normal guest. Uh, normal, but doesn't mean not special. Um, Alex, how are you doing, Alex? Um, hi, Brad. I'm great. Um, happy New Year to everyone. And yeah, normal doesn't mean normal. <laughs> so, I apologize for being uh, one or two minutes late. See this background behind me? Our lovely producer Nadine was like, your background is a little bit cropped out and a little bit weird, and uh, maybe we should fix the little black bars. And I'm like, all right, let's try that. But then the aspect ratio is a problem, and I'm just trying to get it right. So now I have this new friend that I can kind of poke at right here because I'm doing a new background roll. Um, but it looks nice and clean and full screen. So apologize for the, for the last minute, uh, two minute or three minute delay. Um, it's all my background's fault, but now it works great, so we're all good. Alex, how was your uh, your New Year's, and how has 2022 been treating you, treating you so far? So far, so great. Uh, we had some uh, uh, nice vacation uh, on a mountain uh, resort here. It's between three mountains, so it's a very special place for uh, for the Bulgarians. Uh, we all love it. Uh, I hate sometimes sometimes myself because I'm not skiing but uh, we had some fun with the kids uh, with uh, slates and so on so it was nice awesome that's great yeah I, I have not been uh, snowboarding or skiing in so long my, my board sits in my garage and cries because I live in flat Texas <laughs> and haven't gotten out there so I'm very jealous uh, Yavor you know the way to my heart thank you so much for asking about the Braves I mean we were I have my uh, my World Series champion balls sitting here on my desk so I got that going for me, um, and I have hat stuff galore um, from uh, from the championship. But we're in off season right now, so um, uh, still a few more months before things kick back up and I get to enjoy my obsession again. Uh, but appreciate the ask, um, everyone. It's great to see you. I think we're gonna have a wonderful stream today. We got a lot to go over. Um, it is all multiplayer today, and I know that uh, from the 13 or 14 plus responses on the uh, dev diary, people seem to be very excited about multiplayer, I think, Alex. Yeah, I hope so, because um, we are extremely excited, uh, actually. And my, um, for me, this game is um, twice the fun uh, multiplayer. I know that for some people, uh, they love the more uh, calm experience in single player, just um, uh, play one game so with their kingdoms, with uh, their um, uh, best uh, pace, so slower games if they want. But I just love the competition, so. It's, um, I hope that people will also love it. Yeah, I know we've, we've shared a couple multiplayer stories here and there throughout our, our streaming journey together, but today we get to focus in on it. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, I know multiplayer is something that I think all Knights of Honor fans have craved uh, since they got their first taste of the game back uh, you know, over a decade and a half ago. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, obviously in the, in the original Knights of Honor, there was just kind of that RTS... Um, you know, kind of like a, a, a like a battle teaser, right? But bringing um, actually kind of like taking a completely different direction. Now we're just bringing the meta game and the world view play to multiplayer, but with a whole bunch of new features and functionality. Um, yeah, I think I think it's really really exciting. So let's um, so last uh, this is the the second part, and there may be a third part. Don't know. We're not saying it's part two of two. It's part it's, two yeah, of n. Second. Yeah, um, and a lot. lot there's a lot to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's quickly just kind of give everyone a, a, a reminder. So um, there is, if you haven't read the dev diary, by the way, community.knightsofhonor.com. You can read all of our dev diaries up there. There's a tremendous amount of content at this point. We've been doing this for a while. And uh, we also have multiplayer part one, which goes through a number of topics. Um, uh, some of those questions you guys may answer if you didn't watch that one. Or sorry, that you may ask today if you didn't watch that one. I'll try to go through the super high level. We're designing multiplayer. Um, to be the world uh, view uh, experience. Um, we do not plan to support um, the RTS uh, gameplay and multiplayer. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that we talked about in our last stream. Uh, I don't want to go through them again or I'll spend the whole stream rehashing last stream's content. So really, uh, if you want to uh, see uh, part one, go watch that video or see that stream uh, or read that dev diary. 
Um, we are supporting right now uh, six players. That number could go up. It won't go down. Um, we're still doing some testing and kind of balancing, but the goal is to allow you to play with yourself and a group of friends, not just one other person, and uh, have a, a lot of fun um, with different experiences in Knights of Honor. So those are the super, super high-level stuff that I wanted to just cover um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a blanket reminder. And again, there is a multiplayer part one. We'll talk about it there. Um, please feel free to consume that content. I'll answer some. I won't be completely... You know, dictatorial. You know, I'll answer a few questions if they come up, but I want to focus on the cool topics we have today. Um, which today we're really talking about, and it's super important, but it's all of the the setup, all the all the options that you have when you're in a multiplayer game. I think that's really the the the, the point of today, right? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, when you when you make different settings, it's it feels like com completely a different game sometimes. So um, I, I think that uh, especially for competitive uh, games and uh, Knights of Honor can be a, a competitive game and it can be completely co cooperative game. Uh, I think uh, both uh, both play types are uh, great. So it can be free for all, of course, if you want to experience uh, the diplomacy part between players. But uh, yeah, settings make the game very different, and uh, they are very important uh, for players who who prefer to play with friends, enemies, or frenemies, as they're called. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> enemies or frenemies. Yeah, I don't know if um, I know that uh, uh, the few times I've played the multiplayer with. Uh, with uh, with the Knights of Honor team, it seems like I have mostly enemies, not frenemies, because everyone likes to gang up on me for some reason. Um, well, so. it's hard to be the publisher in the studio, you know? <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the truth? I will never forget the, the famous island invasion of, I think that was 2020, 2020 or 2021, I don't know whatever that was, uh, when I had three of you guys uh, all decide that, nah, this, uh, this land is our land, not Brad's <laughs> land, that's for sure. All right, well, um, there's a question that's coming up in chat already about the starting periods. Um, so I think that's where we actually start off in this stream, uh, or in the dev diary. So the um, there are three kind of uh, predefined starting periods that we're offering in the game. Maybe you can go into a little bit of detail about that, because I see um, DeathBGG already asking that question. So... Yeah, um, so first of all, uh, top level, uh, what the periods uh, define is uh, the political landscape, uh, what kingdoms do we have in the game, and this uh, has um, uh, impact on a lot of features. Uh, for example, uh, what units uh, there will be available in, uh, available in the game, because some of them are uh, specific for some kingdoms or a uh, uh, set of kingdoms. Uh, it will define the tension in some regions, because um, there are some mixtures of uh, fates and uh, more segmented regions of the map, so uh, it's uh, it's pretty pretty important. Uh, probably um, we should go through the three different periods uh, separately. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, I think that'll be interesting for people. Go ahead and uh, and let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. By the way, while you're watching, um, for those that are no wait this way, for those that are looking this way, we are showing a whole bunch of new gameplay footage today. I should have started with that. So uh, the team recorded a whole bunch of cool content while they were playing uh, some multiplayer sessions, and uh, we're going to be rolling that footage and that B-roll throughout the stream. So for those that are uh, regular customers, so to speak, regular fans of the of the show, um, you're going to see a whole bunch of new footage throughout the stream today. So I hope you enjoy that. Go ahead, uh, Alex, please. Let's, let's go through the different three regions, uh, three time frames, real quick. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of personal opinion, um, but um, uh, I will mention just the things that I find. Uh, best in the three different periods. Uh, well, in the first one, uh, uh, what's uh, very nice for me is that um, um, there are a lot of pagan uh, kingdoms, and um, this makes a huge difference if you want to play um, as a pagan, because uh, there are a lot of pagan territories to expand to, and um, not all of your neighbors hate you so much, uh, and it's, uh, it creates very good tension. We have uh, uh, Kumania, um, uh, not from the Balkans, uh, we have uh, the Pechenex, uh, we have the Finns um, and some uh, other uh, kingdom, Nordic kingdoms. Uh, I'll, I'm not sure uh, if I'll get those right, but uh, Esti, Semigalia, Sarema, I think. Uh, there, are some, there are plentiful uh, pagan kingdoms and uh, because uh, playing a pagan is pretty cool, uh, it's uh, the best period to, to play as one, well. and you have uh, uh, more choice which kingdom to pick. Um, 
So um, this is probably uh, what what I find best there. Uh, we have uh, some uh, great uh, caliphates and uh, Islamic kingdoms in that period as well. Uh, the Almoravids are uh, pretty deep into Spain. Um, they're um, uh, very powerful. Well, I think not yeah. not to cut you off, but if you go through the details of every period in this level, we're going to be here for about three okay. or four hours. So yeah. let's talk uh, okay. about a little bit quicker, and then we can go into okay. the other options here. <laughs> you, you see, see, Alex is so into this <laughs> that like once he gets going about a detail on this thing, I have to kind of. It's it, you can see like the the both the passion and like the designer nerdism that goes on in a positive way. Like you know everything about this. So it's really easy. So um, there's, there's, yeah. I guess the the high level you can get from even that one deep dive. Um, there's a lot in there when it comes to each of the regions and how their custom options really can change the way that the game experience goes based on which kind of you know area or kingdom that you like to play or what maybe which religion or affiliation you want to start with. Um, you know the variety even in just those three era changes are quite a bit so really quickly yeah. what, what are the three areas and kind of their high level vision that may be helpful so this first one was uh, 1100 uh, it's the, the beginning of the 12th century the second one um, is uh, more than a hundred years after that it's uh, around uh, 1224 I think and um, actually what's great since I did this um, about it is that uh, there is a Bulgaria there. <laughs> Uh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. before that, uh, before that we we get uh, that huge uh, Byzantium, uh, which uh, has conquered uh, the the whole Balkan Peninsula, and here we have a uh, pretty strong Bulgaria. Uh, some and, Bulgarian love in chat. Uh, who, who who's a fan of yeah, the Bulgarian? Yeah, definitely. Right. Uh, and also we have uh, some great caliphates. There are uh, there uh, Ayyubids and uh, Umuhats. Uh, so. Um, yeah, if you if you want to fight for caliphates to be the only one, uh, it's pretty interesting right there. And uh, the third one, uh, it's um, uh, I think 1360, uh, which is uh, when the Reconquista is al almost done. Uh, we have very strong Castile there. Uh, England is crazy powerful at that period. It has a lot of uh, territories uh, in mainland. Uh, Ireland is uh, under England's control and. Uh, um, yeah, uh, we have the Golden Horde there, uh, a lot of cool stuff, uh, and uh, yeah, we have a very powerful Lithuania, which is the strong, strongest pagan uh, kingdom in the game uh, from all periods. So if you want to, uh, to start with uh, very, very strong pagans, easy modes, uh, well, Lithuania is the way to go. So I think that's the top level. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I mean, it, it really is... Um a great starting point for allowing you to enjoy the game in a couple of different ways. Um, we, we've talked about historical accuracy as a um, as a guiding principle, but not a rule. Um, one of our main pillars is that we do uh, want to be historically accurate, but to us, fun or game over historical accuracy. So there are a few liberties we've taken here and there to kind of bring each of those eras to life in a way that we feel will drive the most uh, uh, fun for the game. And, and I think the um, you know, I think you'll still appreciate the tremendous amount of research and effort went into each. I, I remember back when we were first setting up, even like the first era, and it was just like, my God, there's a lot of provinces and a lot of names we got to get right, and a lot, a lot of research on what things were called in this part of the world, and debates about, you know, even in in one era, different people had different ways they referenced certain parts of the world. So it was it was a complex. Yeah. Um, deep dive and I think you'll enjoy um, that not just from a multiplayer standpoint from a game standpoint in general uh, one question I do want to take really quick even though we did so um massive 90 is asking about um, the uh, um, the RTS or our battles in multiplayer we talked about this for about 10 minutes I think on the uh, multiplayer part one stream so I I'm not gonna go all the way into it because if, if you want to hear that I think the answer is way more comprehensive um, I'll just say simply that we gave it a lot of thought and uh, we feel like it's much better for the multiplayer experience that we simulate all of the battles in multiplayer. Uh, there are a whole bunch of reasons for this. And again, if you go um, watch that stream, you'll, you'll be able to see all of it and, and understand kind of what our thinking was there. It wasn't a decision we took lightly. It honestly took us over a year of debate and discussion and design experiments and blah, 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 before we finally reached that conclusion. Um, and we did it for what we think is for the better of the entire experience. So... Um, uh, please, if you want to get more into the details, I talk about it for quite a bit on the other stream, and I think uh, that'd be more informative than me trying to do it here. So, um, 
Let's go. Another thing I think is important to, to mention about, and we've talked about this um, across all of our streams. Um, if you want to go and maybe uh, inject your own labeling or, or, or province layout for a kingdom that's near and dear to your heart, and you have a little bit of modding chops, um, all of these, you know, you can go in and modify all of this as a modder and uh, create your own era, so to speak. Isn't that right? Yeah, all right. You can uh, redefine uh, the kingdoms that are in and uh, what, uh, which kingdom owns which province, uh, to whom are the uh, the loyalty of the population of each province and so on. Um, there is a lot of power in this. Uh, we are still discussing what uh, what will be the exact tools that we will provide. Um, uh, there are another uh, other options also. You can uh, load uh, a game from a save and uh, start completely on you, but just use the political map. So uh, if you have some uh, very interesting uh, situation, you can just save it and uh, start from there with some friends and so on. So um, there are a lot of possibilities, a lot of things that uh, can be uh, edited. Uh, we will probably make a dev diary uh, for modding, uh, but uh, it will definitely be a bit later on because it's uh, still one of the uh, features that is uh, under construction, debated and so on. So we'll see what, uh, what we'll be able to provide on release, what will work on uh, later on and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think we'll save some of the mod conversations about like, there, there are some, and some of it's still being discussed quite actively about creating your own world. I'm not going to comment on that quite yet, but there's, there's a lot of mod functionality that's there. There's a lot that we're striving for, and there's some things that we probably won't support officially out the door, but I never, I, if there's one thing that I've learned in my, my time in this business, I never uh, want to underestimate just how crazy modders can get when they figure out how to pull things apart and make their own stuff. So um, who knows what people can pull off. Uh, now, another key aspect that you can control, I think this is a really um, critical feature um, for how you set up your game, is, is kind of the option you have around kingdom and province setup. Because, you know, you can play with a historical setup, um, and, and every kingdom is exactly the way it is in kind of the single player experience, but that may not create the most even playing field in multiplayer, right? Like some kingdoms are just going to be differently sized than others and positions are different and blah, blah, blah. So that, that has quite a bit of, of an impact. But I think one thing that I like is that we have some options for you to, as a host or whoever's setting up the game, decide um, to almost like custom kingdom, right? Like it's, it's still the name of the kingdom that you want, but it based on everyone's going to have three provinces that's a human or four provinces or whatever. You can, you can add those parameters in to make it even. Yeah, it's very important because initially we had just the historical mode and uh, it's okay we sometimes use it uh, because we want uh, more more immersive experience and uh, it's okay for weaker players to get bigger kingdoms and so on but we wanted uh, to um, at the same time have a balanced game for, for multiplayer and uh, not limit the players to play for example you don't have that many kingdoms with exactly four starting provinces or six starting provinces uh, so uh, right now you can just pick uh, a kingdom or not just a kingdom but even a province uh, and uh, that province or kingdom will be shrinked or expanded uh, to the customized uh, to the selected size uh, it's just an option uh, everyone can uh, just um, either choose a specific custom size for each player or just start with the historical kingdoms. I think it it was, uh, I, I remember these debates in the beginning because it definitely was, uh, it's almost like, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are old school GoldenEye fans, um, but old school GoldenEye and it's like, okay, no one can play Odd Job because Odd Job's like just not, you know, he's shorter than everybody else and that hitbox and like, Odd Job's not fair. And I remember like playing with, with friends back in the old days. And, Odd job. You try to pick odd job, you get hit, right? No one plays odd job. <laughs> in a way, it's almost the same with, uh, you know, a, a variation in the Knights of Honor multiplayer, the Knights of Honor 2 multiplayer, where it's like, you can't play that kingdom. Like, you're going to be so much ahead of everybody else. That's not fair. Uh, yeah, so these yeah. settings kind of allow you to, to, to not have that thrown in while still being able to play, like, Bulgaria, if you want. You can play Bulgaria, but then still even out the, the, um, the, the, the size so that you all have kind of a, a, a balanced experience. Yeah, we went a bit further the last few days. It's something very new, and uh, we even removed the patriarchs uh, of uh, Autokephalios uh, kingdoms. Uh, so because they are they are very strong, and it's a nice goal of the game to to have a patriarch. 
Uh, so uh, we just, uh, for, for if you're not playing historical kingdoms, you don't get a patriarch right now, and you don't get trade centers in the beginning. So we we added some additional um, uh, limitations for players uh, which do not play on historical mode. Yeah, for yeah. balancing I mean, reasons, of course. And I'm sure as we continue uh, refining and polishing, there's other things that are going to continue to come up. It's a constant, and, and even after launch, right? Like it's it's uh, sometimes surprising at what elements can really impact. Um, the progression curves, uh, both from economy, from from diplomatic, because uh, you know, diplomatic uh, pressures are not just isolated to size. It can be position, it can be religion, it can be it, you know a lot of different things. So yeah. we're still learning uh, that that and trying to you know polish the experience as much as possible. And um, yeah, it's, we it's know that um, we can never have completely equal start because some provinces are bigger. Uh, you can have uh, a lot stronger. Um, uh, neighbors which can be a huge benefit or a huge problem it depends so um, th there is some randomness uh, always and some inequality but uh, we are trying to keep it uh, as small as possible for such game I, I, I'm chuckling because I mean uh, I, I by the way your everyone's excitement in chat is really appreciated it means a lot to us and, and you can see how much effort we're putting into trying to make the best game we have but Peldroth, I, I highly recommend when this game does finally come out, whether it's you know release or early access or whatever, that you do not quit your job, and uh, you maintain a living so that you can play the game and uh, as well as you know pay for food, even if it's you know uh, a part-time job so you can eat ramen and play a lot of nights of one or two. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not gonna dictate to you what you should do, but you know jobs are good. It's good to you know it's good to you know take care of yourself. So um, maybe we need to add a special like a. Uh, Beldroth TV flag, where if Beldroth only allows a game to be played a certain amount of hours per week, so he has his you know job safety net uh, still in there. I'm I'm just kidding. Yeah, it's but, not okay. If he quits, I quit too. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Beldroth, if you quit your job to play Knights of Honor 2, Alex is leaving the team. So you can't leave. You, you gotta you gotta find a way to balance it. <laughs> yeah. I hope Vesso is in the background. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> Do not quit your job. If Alex goes, we're in trouble. Oh man! So uh, let's go into a couple more settings, and then we have uh, we have uh, uh, Georgie in the background here that we're going to bring in. Um, so with the uh, the next setting we were talking about is the AI difficulty, which is also super important because even though you're playing with human players, it really makes a big difference how the AI impacts your game, how um, how aggressive or passive it is at the start when it decides to start being aggressive, because it. You know, you're playing not, I mean, it, there's only a certain number of human players, so most of the world is populated by AI. Yeah, yeah, even if you compete uh, between each other, it's um, uh, it makes a huge difference uh, how aggressive, uh, how strong uh, your neighbors are. Uh, so uh, it uh, defines uh, the pace of the game. Uh, uh, so it, it's not just, um, it, it's hard to, to call it difficulty in that case, it's uh, much more than difficulty. It's yeah. uh, just the dynamic of the game. Uh, so uh, if you if you want more casual experience or uh, easier to beat AIs, uh, lesser problems with uh, rebellion risk and so on, um, you, you just want to play, um, even if you play a versus game, uh, you'd like to play some, uh, some war difficulties for the AI. And uh, for cooperative, it's um, obviously uh, hugely important uh, the difficulty because it's pretty much the players against the world so it's like in single player almost yeah i know we talked about um in one of the mul in multiplayer part one some of the different like game modes that are in there and that also can really impact what kind of ai experience you want because some of your game modes are kind of designed for um short chunk type experiences like an hour or 45 minutes or whatever um and in that situation the ai is really just there to be conquered and to be leveraged in order to hit your goals it's not like you're trying to find them as a challenge it's a race like everyone's trying to get to wherever they're trying to get um versus if you're playing like a more epic campaign you may want the ai to be a little more dynamic and more responsive so that you get that kind of grand arc to everything and i and i think we're, we've added a number of controls in already to tune how the AI works, and I think that's going to be something we continue to expand as we as yeah. we develop, because it, it really does allow a lot of power to the players to define what kind of multiplayer experience they're going to have, and that's super important, I think. Yeah, huge. Yeah, so um, that's I think we're going to go into kind of the the more multiplayer specific settings for a second. We have a lot of questions popping up, so I want to make sure we have 
enough time for questions. So, Alex, so long, farewell for the moment, for a time. See you in a bit. Yeah, everyone, and, and don't quit. <laughs> uh, and we're going to bring uh, uh, Georgie on here, um, and then we're going to get into the next topic. So, uh, I'm going to wait till I see Georgie here. Is Georgie here? Hello, hello. I hear a thumbs up. How are you, Georgie? All right, all right, I'm good. Thanks for having me again. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> yeah. How is your beard? We're still growing, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> I think if we're not careful, my hair may eclipse your beard in length impressiveness in, in, a, in a while. I'm getting there, right? We have some. Yeah, you are. Uh, you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have a good year? My... Yeah, yeah, it was pretty chill, pretty normal, nothing exciting. Just, uh, just a good time to take a break for a week or so, or a week or two, just to play games and just be lazy. <laughs> Can I can I get can I ask the fun question of what you may have played during the New Year break? Do you want to admit? Uh, I I started playing Prey and I also oh uh, that's cool. That's I cool. tried to yeah tried to finish it, but as any game I start I just uh, go to like fifty percent of it and I just end and I start something different. It's just a yeah. nasty habit I have. <laughs> I I know I know exactly what you mean. I was playing um, uh, shoot what was it the that new um. JRPG that came out, um, uh, Tales of Arise. I was playing Tales of Arise, oh. and I got to the very end of it, right before the the Thanksgiving break. And I keep on telling myself I got like two or three hours to finish it. I should just go finish it. And now we're here in January, and I've been playing already a whole bunch of other stuff. So I feel yeah. out. Man. <laughs> well, um, as much as everyone wants to hear about our our hair stylings and the games we're playing, we should probably talk about multiplayer a little bit. Absolutely. So. Everything on your side of the stream is going to be about the kind of uh, multiplayer-specific settings. So a lot of the stuff that George and I were talking about before are things that are, are present in the single player because, you know, they're the similar types of modifiers and the controls are applicable to both sessions. Um, but on, on, the, on the multiplayer front, there are some specific settings that are really designed exclusively for the multiplayer's um, uh, uh, game experience. And um, I think that's... Um, important because there are and i know i think when vesa was on a stream i can't remember how long ago we talked about this um it, there, there's a lot of complexity that may not be obvious at first but when you really start thinking about how these features work um they function completely different in a multiplayer game versus a single player game yeah absolutely uh there are a bunch of settings for multiplayer that you can see when you start a single player campaign but they're very important for shaping the overall experience and obviously when you start looking for a multiplayer game you can see those and you can check out and determine if you really want to join them because after you play a bunch of games you can kind of determine what kind of playstyle you expect uh and we're gonna go uh, deeper into them for example wars are really uh, specifically restricted or allowed in games uh, that are multiplayer also espionage etc but i also want to mention that there are so many systems in the game that uh, when we developed them we've kind of had to ship them a bit for multiplayer for example if you have emperor yeah. of the world and you vote there the timings are different if you lead an audience with some other kingdom that's a player one the dynamic is also a bit different there so it's a uh, it's a completely different ballpark in some of those mechanics yeah yeah absolutely and um i think it's it's uh, when players finally get their hands on things we're just scratching the surface of some of those because it, it really does need that kind of um curated separation between how things work that are fun in a single player experience because you're doing them to an AI and the AI is not a human versus in the multiplayer experience when you if someone does them to you or if you do them to someone else and the reaction um, is is dynamic um, it's mm -hmm. not as fun <laughs> they have to be uh, they have to be altered so let's talk about the first one which uh, we talk about in the dev diary again community.knightsofhonor.com you can read the dev diary if you like um, so the first one is about player wars so there's a number of options around when and how players can go to war. Maybe you can just summarize them really quick. All right, so let's go through them briefly. Uh, you can restrict player wars if you want to. That's the most important bit. Uh, and this is an, an option that, uh, for example, if you're playing in teams, let's say 3v3, and uh, you really want to start off peacefully or continue throughout the game, uh, there's a bunch of different options. You can completely uh, remove the option to allow uh, wars between players altogether, or you might restrict them for a certain time period or generations. So uh, you have those options, uh, basically whatever you want to do. And uh, if you play in a team with someone else, so for example, you and me play against Alex and Vessel, uh, 
us as teammates, we cannot declare war between each other uh, because right. we are teammates. Yes, so that's another restriction that applies. Uh, but I think this is a very important option because, uh, I mean, from experience from playing multiplayer strategy games where people, I mean, most of the times we kind of remove the, uh, we create a soft cap for ourselves. We say, hey, let's, let's not wage war, let's just play peacefully. Uh, yep. But there are some players that just want the crazy Owen experience, which is uh, really drastically different than single player because uh, multiplayer is such a dynamic landscape that sometimes wars can be a bit overwhelming. Yeah, what I love about it is the ability to kind of have different ways that you restrict um, player wars from happening, and uh, you know, one of them is, uh, you know, obviously just pure time. Um, and it's like, okay, how long do we want to allow before player wars can happen, if you allow them to happen at all? Um, another one is, and I think it's very unique to the Knights of Honor experience, but very interesting, which is basically lineage, right? Um, yeah. Like how often uh, you're, you know, you, you change sovereign. Um, and Knights of Honor 2 sovereign, hooray, what a great... <laughs> but um, uh, how often you change sovereigns. And I saw a question um, that will, I think will kind of answer ahead of time. Like, well, who was it that asked this? Um, there was someone from the uh, forums that asked about a potential exploit opportunity. I want to say it was... Uh, one of William Blake's questions, he asked 20 minutes. Uh, but the, uh, the question was really clever, because it's like, okay, well, if you have it set to uh, the time frame of Sovereign, couldn't you just kill your Sovereign to get to the war de declaration faster? <laughs> yeah, and that is I a bad question. It is, but it's, 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 the game doesn't quite work that way, because you still need to have time to go get married and then have children, and that child has to really kind of um, I mean, you could do it when they're young, but that also puts you at a huge disadvantage because then you don't have the weight of the king's skill sets potentially. So there's a lot of like, it's not something where you can just roll it really, really fast. You could maybe do it expedited, but it's not as simple as just trying to blaze through it in a very, very short period of time. There's a lot yeah, of and that, Absolutely, and there's also another specific aspect to that, and uh, it's because uh, the rules are if you die, for example, you and me play uh, together, and it's 1v1, and if the goal is for three kings to die. If uh, I reach three kings and you are still on your first lineage, the game won't end. Both of us have to reach that third lineage, so that's a, that's a way to eliminate the exploitiveness, so you can't really suicide rush your uh, rulers uh, before their player, right, because okay. yeah, otherwise it would be, as whoever asked, uh, asked the question, it would be like that, but we don't want that as a fact. Yeah. And I do, I actually, uh, it, it's, it's really fun that these settings are in there, because like you mentioned, I know a lot of times when I've played different games throughout my gaming experiences, you do kind of set the friend rules, um, mm -hmm. and people respect it, but it's also nice um, to have the game uh, provide some of those options, and we're all gamers, so we, we, we've had enough of those experiences where, oh yeah, it was always fun to play that, maybe we can like let the game help that, help that happen, so yep. that's really cool. Um, now another uh, um, uh, a, a cool setting I think we have is how espionage works, and I think espionage is another very interesting feature set in multiplayer. I know that it, it's I may be exaggerating, but it, from my observations, in my opinion, it was probably the hardest, if not one of the top hardest features we had to deal with in multiplayer. Um, espionage are kind of like super weapons in a way because they can have devastating consequences. And it feels great when you're doing it against an AI. It's a lot of fun to pull off, uh, you know, an espionage action. But when it comes and happens against you, it can be very, very painful. And we do a lot of logic on the AI side to still put espionage pressure on you without ruining your game. But in multiplayer, you go build, like, three high-powered spies and start going to town. Like, it can... you can ruin someone's experience, pretty much. Like, troll them to death. And that's not fun for the person that's on the receiving it could be fun in certain circumstances, but by and large, it's not going to be an enjoyable game. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, as much as it is a high-risk, high-reward element of the game, from for the most part of the game, uh, it still is uh, one of the aspects that can uh, make you rage quit if you're not prepared for it. Uh, yeah, yeah. And th that's why we've implemented those options for basically every single uh, spy port that we have in the game, we can control uh, if it is allowed, determining on the setting that's chosen in the game. So you can uh, limit them, you can make them a bit more available, or you can just go unlock everything and just uh, enable complete havoc. Uh, 
it's going to be really interesting to see once uh, many people start playing the game what would be the most uh, picked option yeah. because uh, i personally like espionage on fully in multiplayer games but uh, like the last two games uh, alex just destroyed me with it i mean uh, it was not pleasant for me at all so i'm kind of rethinking my words right now uh but it is laugh, so, so you guys can't see him because he's in the background yeah. now but i see him just laughing and chuckling in the background so i think he takes great pride in the fact that he uh he uh trolled your yeah he's he's doing the thumbs up <laughs> yeah we'll talk yeah. about that we go to all three of us here in about 10 minutes um <laughs> Uh, but players. it is a, it is a one of I think it's the, one of the trickiest things to nail down in multiplayer and uh, yeah. in terms of player dynamics. And I think it's going to be something that we're going to see in the future how it turns out. Because right now we are playing a lot with each other and other people, but uh, when a whole different bunch of different playstyles come in, it it's going to be an interesting experiment to have. Good day, yeah. sir. Uh, so, so Kings of Honor, uh, which I, I know you go by um, your other uh, pseudonym on the forum. You should know the answer to that, right, buddy? Come on now. You watch those dev streams and dev diaries, every one of them. We talk about that during the... Uh, there is an espionage stream. I encourage you to watch it or read it. We do talk about how um, the spy mechanics work as well as how you can, uh, I guess, technically defend against them. Though that's kind of a complicated topic. So uh, don't have time to go into it here, um, but we do have an entire hour-long stream and extensive dev diary about the espionage feature set and uh, uh we, i think we do um uh, talk about that there yeah we talk so I'll, I'll answer it why not so um uh there's more details in the stream but um it's all good uh basically there's different um uh factors that play into how likely a espionage action can be completed some of it is a kingdom power differential between you uh or the the the, the kingdom that's attempting to do the action and the kingdom that's receiving the action so if there's a larger differential um then the success or failure chance is influenced based on you know the person that's doing it or the person that's not that's not there is um some baseline skills for both uh spies that are at home um and kind of a defensive stance as well as your king um and your king's level kind of influences that a little bit when it comes to the level of certain skills he has maybe uh and there are also elements of like what your king's class is so if your key is the king is a spy he has some substantial boost to protection. So it's a number of different factors that all combine together to equal the espionage chance uh, success. And then there's also a number of things about like the action itself and what kind of action it is. Some actions have a greater or lesser chance to be defended against depending on this, the layout. So it's it's complicated um, on purpose. It's, it's designed to be very dynamic as it would be, I think, in that era. So. Um, uh, I, I believe we go into it for about for a little bit during that stream. Um, but yeah, yeah. there's there's quite a bit in there. I I, I want to answer the question, but also you know, it's we could meand. We maybe we should do a stream one day where we just sit there and let people ask whatever they want, like almost like an AMA, yeah. and we just go through all these different topics. Um, or just uh, play so, with spies against each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it would just be goat questions the whole stream. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, so we have the to clarify from the from the diary. There's kind of, right now I believe there's a number of different knobs, but there's three main ones, which is uh, full espionage actions, which mean all things are valid, limited, which means I guess all of the superpower type ones, like killing a king or blah 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 are removed, um, and then we have forbidden, which means espionage is not allowed at all against uh, uh, human players, right? Did I, did I summarize that right? Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Um, so, and you... you, you... <laughs> You're playing, I guess, when Alex trolled you, you were playing full, I'm guessing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> it was full. I mean, it's, it's it's also interesting because most time when you're playing with people, you already have voice chat or you're just uh, trolling in chat, so you, you kind of know who's doing it. Uh, sure. Most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're cackling on voice chat while they're watching you be like, C oh, come on, right? Like the reaction you're waiting. You're waiting for it after you send that... Uh, that um you know that spy to go do the the hunting accident for your prince or whatever it may be yeah <laughs> um so the last uh setting that we talked about in the diary and i i really personally really really like this one it's it's, it's i don't want to say it's near and dear to my heart but it's something i have some personal game experience with in my own uh strategy game multiplayer playing um is how we handle eliminated players may god um, bless and a number of strategy games have different ways they deal with this um, some don't at all, and some have different options. Day, so maybe sir. you can give the audience um, a real quick, day, uh, um, you know, uh, high level on on how we what options we provide for eliminated players. 
Yeah, so option number one is simply no ripic. So when you're once you're defeated in any way, that's it, game over. But there is also one, two, or three ripics you can do after you've been defeated. So once you were defeated, you gain the big fancy defeated screen. You have a button that says pick new kingdom, and then there's a list of kingdoms you may pick from, uh, which we are determining based on certain logics uh, we've been implementing. Uh, you can you also can't uh, pick. Uh, something like the papacy because it's uh, currently uh, forbidden from the regular picking logic uh, so those things all come into consideration but you can continue playing and uh, it's funny because many different uh, many different moments when i've been starting with let's say one province and i get defeated by uh, a bunch Alex. of kingdoms uh, yeah maybe <laughs> usually it's just ai's that bunch up on me for some reason they hate me uh, and I, i'm just like all right i'm just, I'm just gonna pick that kingdom and play with it i mean you took my province i'm gonna pick with my new provinces <laughs> from the same ones you got for me so things like that can happen it's uh it's uh once again it depends on the players uh, if you really want to be hardcore about it you can make it so you're eliminated immediately but i think it's always fun when you're playing with a large group of people and uh it makes for longer sessions and uh more flexible ones yeah yeah, I, I know, and I, I like the fact that we have different slider bars there because I know, um, you know I, I, I played a lot of strategy games in my life, and I played uh, quite a bit of Alpha Centauri multiplayer because I had a friend that used to like doing that with me mm. back in the old days, and um, I remember a number of times where you would get past like the only controls you had was really like a time limit for when you could allow those respawns to take place. I remember a number of games where like that time limit for respawning and redoing a new city would expire, and then he would die, um, or I would die. <laughs> And the other person was having a great game, and they're like, well, I guess I don't get to keep going. Like, I'm having fun, but you got screwed because you made mistakes, and so now the game is over for both of us because, you know, there's no options. So being able to um, control that where it's like, no, if you want responding for forever, so that even if they're going to be starting kind of lower off, they can still play, uh, those options are there. I think it's a really compelling slider set of, set of controls to add in. Yeah, definitely. One of it's one of those uh, main mas main aspects of multiplayer. We've wanted to really give players control to shape their campaigns. It's up to them, whatever they want to do. Definitely. Also, DJ Isma, I saw you were uh, a little bit late to the stream, but welcome. Always good to see you, man. Um, yeah, and I, I think there's there, this is there's a number of other settings I'm guessing that we have that we didn't talk about in the dev diary, um, and ones that we're still discussing and maybe debating about adding. Is there any that you may want to like? Uh, um, share with the class uh, that we didn't talk about in the diary before we go into questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Like uh, some really basic but important ones, ones we haven't focused on is uh, you can determine what starting goal you have, which is valid for both single and multiplayer. Uh, there are different values depending on if it's single or multiple, it's still the same aspect. And you may also determine how fast your kings age, which is a really important metric because oh, uh, right. it shapes. Uh, long term it shapes uh, how it goes for example you may start with a kingdom that uh, if, if you pick historical kingdoms you may start with a kingdom that doesn't have any successors and if you uh, make aging fast it's uh, basically hard more hard, hardcore difficulty because you don't have any successors and you gotta find marriage you gotta have time to have children that, successors that and so on. you only have a certain amount of time yeah oh yeah definitely and if uh, you've entered generations it's a time limit as well then uh, you kind of uh, create a really interesting game mode that way. And uh, I think uh, we can also focus on, but I saw there's questions, so I guess we're going to answer them as well, but uh, two really important options for multiplayer are uh, restrictions for pausing and then pausing uh, and game speeds. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Because it's a, one of, it's a tricky aspect to balance uh, because you don't know if you're playing with random people if they're going to grief and pause all the time so you can implement some restrictions for example it takes uh, into account how long was the previous pause duration uh, so you can't really spawn pause all the time same goes for pausing there's a uh, specific uh, limitations in terms of how many seconds or minutes you can play before uh, the game is paused uh, and also minimum maximum game speeds uh, you can determine if you want the maximum game speed to be controlled up to let's say four or six times or just restricted to a regular playing field where you can only play times one and uh, yeah, with a lot of players uh, yeah. it's important 
Yeah, so uh, I don't know if William Blake is listening uh, or is on here, but that was a couple of his questions were centered around kind of pausing in game speed. So I think we actually jumped a little bit into the questions uh, oh, yeah. earlier. Yeah. So that's awesome. No, it's great. That's no, great. It, it's awesome to cover the questions as we go. Uh, by the way, Yavor, I do have Age of Wonders, Planet Fall, and have played it a little bit. I liked it. A little bit different than Alpha. I liked Alpha Centauri well, for a lot of reasons. I'm a big Civ fan, but I love the personalities in Alpha Centauri. I think the, the unique personalities of the of, of the faction lead they had were incredible i hated deidre with a burning passion i often played the spartans um morgan was a nuisance um the little brain guy was i can't remember the brain guy's name but he was always my friend so i just liked the the personalities and kind of it felt like you're getting to know this cast of kingdoms and and it was limited enough with enough depth that um and uniqueness that made it a lot of fun but yeah, planet ball is great uh, i i've enjoyed that too so let's go ahead and let's 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 bring the trio in. Let's get the band back together. Um, we'll pull Alex right. in here and we'll spend the next uh, uh, 14 or 15 minutes uh, doing questions. As always, I like to start with questions from the um, the diary. We had a lot uh, this time around, so I don't think I'm going to be able to get to all of them because I want to take some from the stream too that we didn't answer as we went. But if you go to knights uh, community at of and uh, check out the uh, yeah Provost Sakharov, thank you um, from Alpha. Uh, check out the diaries and uh, you put your questions in the diary itself. Um, I always check them the night before and have my, my, my handy dandy list so your chances of getting your questions read and answered are a lot higher. So um, the first one is a question that we can't answer yet unfortunately but I do want to acknowledge it. So Ivory Knight, um, who's all I know on the stream, was asking about basically how is communication handled in multiplayer? Will it be built-in voice chat systems or just text-based? Um, I would greatly be like to be able to chat with all human players and also have a separate chat for my own allied human players. So, um, as far as text chat is concerned, we're still working on exactly how far those features are going to extend, but there's quite a, uh, there's a lot of conversation going on about how text chat will work and maybe it's something we include in a future dev diary. As far as voice is concerned, um, right now we're leaning on the side of not having voice integrated in it for multiplayer. Uh, it's maybe something that we revisit depending on how people talk. But um, our read so far is that a lot of people use either Steam voice integration or Discord or whatever when they're playing. Even if you're playing with random, Steam is pretty easy to use. Um, so there's still, again, it's not a closed topic and there's there's been discussions back and forth. Um, it's always tricky. I know me personally, and, and I've talked, we've done polls on this on other projects as well as on, on uh, you know, that a lot of people use their own voice comps, right? It should become a kind of standard these days. Um, and I personally know that I always use my own voice comps too. So, um, the effort it takes to make that system work seamlessly can be put towards other features, and it often is one thing that's that's removed. But it's not, again, it's not a closed topic, and if, if we find enough people really express interest in it, we can we can discuss it. Um, uh, the next question is about, uh, um, so, Do Vila Legend um, asks, I think we kind of answered this organically, but I'll throw it out there just so we can clarify. Um, Will it be possible to set these kind of parameters in a single player too, like king aging, starting gold, etc.? Uh, Alex, why don't you take that one? Um, yeah, uh, these parameters are also included in single player. They are not multiplayer exclusive uh, for multiplayer. We have just excluded what's uh, uh, for single player. We have excluded only those that uh, does not make sense for single player, obviously. And we tried to separate out in the dev diary stuff that was multiplayer specific. So hopefully that you know clarifies that the other topics or other settings are definitely exposed in single player as well. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, Zerg asked a couple questions about spectator mode. Can you join a game only as a spectator? Can you stay in a game as a spectator after being defeated? Um, I don't believe. Now remind me if I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe right now we don't have a way to join as a passive spectator. Is that correct? Right now it's not possible. Um, it was technically possible at one point, but um, I don't think we're doing it. Um, there are uh, a lot of ways to stream right now. It's integrated in Steam, so you can always have your buddies watching. Um, we have discussed um, implementing uh, some special um, uh, features for stream, like uh, selecting and checking whatever you want, but uh, right now um, I don't think that uh, we'll implement this on uh, a release, and yeah, uh, maybe if uh, if the people uh, really want it, uh, we can work on it in in future. Yep. Um, uh, another question that he asked, which I think we we didn't talk about too much, but we may have talked about this in multiplayer part one, which is how are packs between human players handled? Can I defame a friend after he agrees to an alliance but doesn't stand any actual troops? 
Um, I believe we do. T I, now I'm remembering. We did talk about that in multiplayer uh, part one quite extensively. I um, there was a whole section about um, you know how that impacts other kingdoms' opinions of you, um, different impacts of breaking or keeping alliances. So. Um, uh, I would encourage you for that question to go check out the Dev Diary uh, Multiplayer Part 1 uh, just so we can stay on t questions that are a little bit newer. But yeah, there's there's a number of different things. You can do a lot, um, but there are consequences of doing those things. Um, and, uh, it just depends on how you want to deal with those consequences if you decide to screw your friends over. Yeah, if you want to play, to play a game which um, you have uh, some volatile um, alliances, uh, you should play uh, just in uh, free-for-all mode, and you can uh, make alliances in-game, which you can break. But if you want to play a team game, it's a team game. Uh, you have a combined score for the whole team and so on, so it's um, um, you, you can achieve both of those uh, gameplay styles if you want. Yeah. Also, I think uh, like Basilisk and a couple other guys, uh, or girls, I'm not sure which, but uh, and a couple of people on the forums were posting some great suggestions for different options for multiplayer. Some that I think we may uh, have not thought of. Um, you know, like Basilisk had a few ideas about adding options for rebellions or religion. I think there's some cool thoughts there. So really appreciate all of the the added uh, uh, um, ideas in it. We we definitely are reading them and, and factoring them in. So um, don't have time to go through all of them, but there's a lot of cool stuff in there to to digest. Let me see if I can grab one more question from the forums, and then I'm going to try to grab a few from um, the chat. Let's see here. Uh, we talked about, uh, so Blake was asking about the max players. We talked about that a little bit before. Um... So I think we can ask. We'll, we'll ask answer this one. So Johnson was uh, um, was said. You know, Johnson, by the way, said was a lurker in one of his first questions. So uh, really awesome that. Uh, oh, my mic is uh, acting weird. Sorry about that. Um, uh, was asking though, are there already diseases like plague and famine, or natural das disasters like volcano eruptions, strong winter in the game, which get affect gameplay, or will there be DLCs in the future that add something like that as an option when you create a game? So we don't have anything quite like that right now when it comes to kind of like those world events, correct? Yeah, I guess the closest thing we have is population growth, which is uh, how fast your population is uh, born in your provinces, but we don't really have diseases quite yet. Yeah. I, I know for uh, you know um, uh, that this was a topic that we, ha uh, we discussed quite a bit early on in development, and... Um, <laughs> I, I, we haven't even gotten to a point where we're announcing a release date, much less talking about any kind of future support and DLC plans. But there are ideas, I'll, I'll say, on the Idea Barn um, that have been discussed uh, when it comes to how we can inject things like world events and, and, and the dynamics of those into the game so it's not um, beyond the realm of possibility. A possibility. Uh, now, how we decide to approach those and what other cool DLC plans or, 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 or post-release uh, plans may... Um, uh, go ahead of them in the list, I'm not sure, but they're definitely have been thought and talked about uh, a number of times. So, good idea there to hear, and we're thinking the same way. So that's kind of cool. The, the funny thing is that we recently um, discussed uh, some um, post-release uh, updates and um, uh, having plagues, uh, healthcare, and uh, uh, climate effect, especially on the southern and northern regions, were uh, part of that discussion. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's kind of fresh. <laughs> so uh, we have five minutes left or so. Let me see if I can grab some questions that I didn't get during the stream. Um, so <laughs> this is a funny one. Kings of Honor asks, what is the hardest country to play uh, in multiplayer, in our opinions? What would you guys think about that? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Pretty much every, uh, every kingdom with a single province. Probably, uh, I, I would suggest um, some of the pagans uh, in the late periods from, from the smaller ones because uh, you have a lot of Catholics that uh, pretty much hate you, so I guess uh, this, this will be the hardest. Yeah, Yeah. I guess it also depends where you spawn compared to the players and what game mode you're playing on. If it's free for all and you're all together, it's a bit of a uh, Owen scenario. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's always tough, too, because it all depends on your play style as well. I actually find playing large kingdoms also very challenging at the start, because you get a lot more aggressive neighbors um, at the very, very beginning. 
And uh, even in, in single player, that can be a, its own unique challenge. But in multiplayer, that's a whole different level of weight because you don't have time to kind of optimize your kingdom in the beginning because you're in pressure right away for some of the AI, especially the AI is set to kind of normal levels, while other players may be able to kind of enjoy a more peaceful coexistence with their neighbors at the start. So there's, there's, it all depends on what kind of things are hard for you, I guess. So, yeah. Uh, Death BGG has a question about how does multiplayer work? Are there servers hosted by you guys or player hosts them? Is the players host them? There are problems with the ports of some internet providers. So the answer is a little bit of both in a weird way. So the the game sessions themselves are um, a client server model. So someone that's uh, one of the clients, I guess, like there's a host. And that host is where a lot of the, the game logic sits. Um, and we've, we're doing quite a bit of work to handle things like um, NAT, you know, network traversal and um, other uh, types of challenges with ports and, and testing. So that should be relatively um, uh, flexible. Obviously, there are some ISPs that have unique issues and, you know, um, we should have most of them handled, but we'll, we'll react to those as they come up. There are also some elements of the multiplayer system that are tied to a light backend that we're hosting, and I'm not going to go into too much of the technical details. It's not really related to the actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay experience itself, but there are, there is some data that's going back and forth um, that is valuable to how we um, uh, know about session information and allow you to rejoin a session, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's 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 kind of a there's elements of both types of systems in there, but it's primarily client server where you're hosting um the 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 host yourself uh sander city 4 asks can you have an unlimited length multiplayer campaign i mean absolutely right yeah yeah Time limits is an option. you can you can do a challenge where one person paints the entire world and then the other person has to try to paint it back I mean, there's all sorts of crazy things you could do uh let's see here so this is an interesting question um that you have asked that i want to take earlier i think it's a cool one so uh more general than it is about knights of honor specifically but i think it's cool so Yavor 984 asked by the way we're always good to see you um i want to ask something as a non-developer how hard is it to fix something in the game after launch is it possible to have a good launch and still add on features in the game or is it a pain so that's very complicated <laughs> Um, and it's complicated for a number of different reasons. Um, it's, it's, uh, when it comes to fixing things like bugs or quality of life improvements, um, it kind of, I mean, bugs are often as straightforward as they would be in fixing them in development, uh, depending on what kind of bug it is. And, uh, those can be fast or, uh, slow, depending on how complex it is for repro cases. Like, is it a random issue? Is it something where we understand what's going on? really easily and it's 100% repro that usually is very easy to fix I mean, not always technically easy but at least it's easier than something we can't repro a lot um but you're kind of blending two concepts which is how is it how easy is it to add features versus um fixing things and adding features really depends because sometimes um the thing that the players want ties into fundamental infrastructure for how the game is built that would require Almost like, um, you know, redoing the foundation of a house. It takes a lot of um, dredging and, and remodeling in order to build that thing on top of something because it's not really structured for that. And those structures are not always obvious. It could be the way the data is put together. Maybe not even something player-facing. Or it could be the way the toolkit is built and how easy it is for us to add or change certain types of things. Um, we built Knights of Honor 2 Sovereign in a very modular fashion with a lot of what's called data-driven structures. Um, with the idea of being able to add things easily, but even during development, we've run into situations where we're trying to change something and realize that, oh wow, this is going to take like three or four months to even get started because there's some really big fundamental changes that touch every aspect of the game, and if we want to do this, it's a big investment. And we've done it. We've, we've definitely made those kind of changes in, of those classes before. Um, so it just depends. Um, and I know that's not. The best answer, but it's 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 a complicated uh, uh, part of game development. Just to add up, it's uh, the process is always uh, more complex because uh, you have to always to work in branches. You want to commit the smallest thing, you have to make a lot of smoke testing and so on. Uh, so um, it's uh, always over uh, post release, but. Um, uh, how difficult it is to debug? It's the same, but the process uh, is more complex, at least. 
Yeah, there's some good... So I don't know how many of you guys pay attention to industry-type stuff like GDC. Um, I think this is like five or six years ago. There was a really cool talk by Paradox. Our, we, we have friends at Paradox, you know, all, all of us in games. It's a small industry. We know each other. We talk quite a bit. Um, and uh, they gave a really, really cool talk about the challenges of um, adding both uh, free and DLC content to games and even some of the challenges they have with certain games that they've made where they added features in, um, uh, in, in paid DLCs that ended up needing support for every other thing they ever did because even though it was ancillary, it added a layer of complexity into the game systems that had to be mirrored across everything in order to work. So it's, it's, it, it can be very, very complicated even in trying to add something so you can think through it and understand the implications for future, de future development and, and, uh, and features. So um, it's a really cool concept and idea to talk about. Um, uh, you know, I, my background, I've, I've worked on um, live-as-a-service games before, so I have a lot of experience in this area because um, those are the worst of this. They're the most complicated. Um, um, but it's, uh, if you guys are interested in that kind of stuff and maybe doing a stream about the more nuts and bolts, of game making. I, I know that you guys often want to see features and whatnot, but if that's something really cool to a large number of you, you know, maybe talk about that in the in Discord or on the forums and maybe we could do a special half stream or stream about more of the the insights into how we do this stuff as opposed to just exposing features. There's a lot that yeah. goes a lot that goes in on in the kitchen before we bring it up to the serve it at the table, so to speak. Do you wanna say something, Alex? No, no, I, I was previously working in the mobile and uh, web games uh, uh, section of the industry, so um, there is a lot uh, we can share about um, live development and uh, development when you have uh, persistent data. You can just, it's not just uh, starting a new game, you, you have to make it uh, backwards compatible with each update, uh, so it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm gonna just answer this one again because it always comes up and it'll be my last question I answer. We aren't talking about release date yet. I know everyone's gonna ask every stream. It's absolutely fine. I don't mind it. I've been being asked it for 24 streams now. It's all good. Um, but no, we're not re You'll know because we'll say it. Um, we're not ready to uh, talk about release date quite yet, but I promise you when we will, we will scream it from the mountaintops with cool content and, and big information. Um, uh, the game is coming along and as you can see from the videos, a lot more polish, but there's still a lot of stuff we're doing, and uh, we want to make sure, like we've said from the very beginning, um, obviously, you know, we try to do the best we can uh, to make the best Knights of Honor 2 version we can, um, and uh, whether we get it right or not, you'll have to tell us when we release the thing, but we're doing our best to give it the time it needs to become the greatest version it can. So um, once we feel like we have that, then uh, we'll, we'll get into more details about release timelines and potentially new betas or whatever. Um, so uh, I, I know uh, as a fan of myself uh, of games, I know how eager uh, everyone gets to know um, and definitely respect that. And um, hopefully sometime we'll I'll be able to share that with you. Alex and Georgie, uh, as always, great to have you guys on. Yeah, thank you for hosting and thanks to everybody for joining in. Thanks a lot. It was really fun once again. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it's, uh, it's great to be in 2022, fresh January month, um, and I uh, hope everyone stays safe out there. I know that there's a lot going on with uh, um, all the COVID stuff, so uh, take care of yourselves. Um, it's great to have you on. We will be back um, in four to five weeks as normal and uh, with a new topic, um, and uh, we hope you guys take care of yourselves. Thank you so much for joining the show. We really appreciate all of your passion and excitement for the game, um, and uh, take care. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Cheers. Take care, guys. See ya.